Hello, my beautiful watchers. I had a bit of a revelation recently that as much of a crowd pleaser as it is when I constantly put out content themed around me thumbling my way through a genre I have little experience in, if I don't start including more books that I genuinely enjoy reading, burnout is going to pretty much be an inevitability for me. So starting now, you're going to be hearing a lot more about books that were seminal to me and the development of my love of reading. I know suffering sells better than enthusiasm, but I hope you will at least get some enjoyment out of this too. Ringworld is a science fiction novel published in 1970 and is considered to be a true classic of the genre. It's what you get when an author's world building is so good it encompasses the literal building of worlds. It was written by Larry Harry Niven, an American author who was already pretty respected in the field at the time, though Ringworld launched him into a whole new level of fame, earning him a Nebula, Hugo, and Lotus Award. Niven would go on to write and co-write multiple other novels in this setting. Said setting became known as Known Space, and it eventually became a shared universe as other authors started writing licensed spin-offs. It's actually impressive he wrote so many books considering he found the time to talk President Ronald Reagan into starting the Strategic Defense Initiative, aka the Star Wars Pro program, almost wasting trillions of dollars on nonsensical, non-existent military technology. Bit of a uh, rabbit hole subject that I don't have the time or inclination to go down right now. Anyway, uh, the known space universe is what some people refer to as hard science fiction, i.e. the fictional scientific principles it introduces are a lot more grounded and better explained than average, often incorporating existing, if as of yet unproven, theories. Good hard science fiction books then unfailingly stick to these predecided principles and incorporate them into the development of the cultures and behaviours of their in-universe people and settings. This is my personal favourite genre of fiction, and Ringworld is a pretty good example of it. Niven never fails to consider how a radical new piece of technology would drastically affect humanity for better, worse, or both. Let me give you as much of a breakdown as I can realistically fit into a YouTube video. In the year 2850, humanity has spread out amongst the stars, partially out of desperation to alleviate the almost world-destroying overpopulation issues on Earth. They've come across multiple sapient alien races, though nowhere near the amount that you see in universes like Star Wars or Star Trek. We're talking single-digit numbers here. They've either developed or acquired huge technological breakthroughs like faster-than-light travel, stasis fields that can halt the passage of time, and short-range teleportation. One of the things that I really like about Niven's writing is how he thinks of uses that might develop from a new technology beyond the obvious. Take the stasis field, for example, a machine that can create or dissipate a space within it where time is static. Obvious uses, well, you can freeze yourself in time and see the future, Philip J. Fry style, which also opens up all kinds of options when it comes to long distance travel. It literally doesn't matter how long your journey is, as long as you make it there in one piece, for you it will be the blink of an eye. No need to make room for large supplies of sustenance, air, or even building a bathroom into your spaceship. However, Niven took it to the next step and considered, if time is something tangible that can be manipulated, and if everything else in the universe in some way exists in time, then logically nothing in the universe would be able to penetrate a stasis field, making it effectively physically indestructible. One of the alien races has put this fact to a really fun use by suspending a microscopically thin thread in a stasis field housed inside a handle that fits nicely in their palms. Now consider, the basic principle of a sword edge is to create a hard surface that is so thin it can cut through things softer than itself. The thinner and harder it is, the more it can cut. With a monofilament in a stasis field, you have yourself the thinnest, hardest substance in the universe. So, ipso facto, you've gotten yourself the ultimate sword, basically weightless and able to cut through titanium like it's warm Butter. Yeah, I went for a sword-related example. I really like swords, okay? Niven also explored what being able to instantaneously travel around an entire planet via teleportation would do to a culture, and apparently came to the conclusion that it would, after only a few generations, erode any differences between nations and countries, merging all of mankind into a unified, if potentially quite boring, culture. It also has the side effect of absolutely erasing everyone's sense of direction and understanding of geography 
photography. If you can walk into a booth and teleport to any location on Earth, what difference does it make what direction your destination is? As I said, there's a few interesting sapient species in this universe, including genetically modified dolphins, which are fun, but alas, feature not in this particular book. The two most relevant to this story are the Kazinti and Pearson's Puppeteers. The worst way that I could describe a Kazin is, imagine if a furry was scary instead of extremely sexy. The best way that I could describe them is they're an eight foot tall bipedal race with the feline characteristics of huge tigers, but with hairless tails like rats and expanding ears like those you would see on a bat. They're an aggressive warrior species that's fought multiple wars of humanity over the years and uh, yeah, I know, I know. Every science fiction universe seems to have an aggressive warrior species, but I would be willing to vouch for the Kazinti being more interesting than average. Kazin philosophy is decidedly alien when it comes to ethics. They embrace slavery, conquering entire species to bind into servitude, but specifically when it comes to combat and warfare, they hold themselves to a code of honor that makes humans look downright savage in comparison. This is one of the reasons mankind has won all of the wars between them. When mankind has its back up against the wall, it will do whatever it takes to survive, no matter how dirty the tactics and no matter the loss of innocent civilian lives. And the Kazinti will not. A Kazin would accept species-wide annihilation before breaking their very strict version of the Geneva Convention. If a Kazin hasn't earned a name for themselves yet, they are known by their job title, which is the setup to an underappreciated fact about the Kazinti, i.e. they are sassy as heck. One of the lead characters in this book is a Kazin ambassador to humanity and he is known as Speaker to Animals. This guy's official job title is just a way of throwing shade on people they don't like. Fun fact, Larry Niven went on to write for Star Trek, the animated series, and oh hey, look who he slipped into that world as well. I didn't realize you could just reuse your ideas like that. Pearson's Puppeteers, the name makes sense in the book, are a fascinating non-humanoid race known for several unusual physical and psychological characteristics. For starters, they have three legs and two heads, neither of which contain their brain, which is located in their torso. Their heads serve as multifunction limbs, encompassing all the usual activities of seeing, eating, breathing, and speaking, while also being their primary manipulators. They're also known for being incredibly intelligent and almost comically cowardly. Everything scares the heck out of these creatures, no matter how unlikely the threat, so their entire culture is based around making things as safe as possible for themselves. It's such a part of their core being that any puppeteer who shows even a little courage is considered certifiably insane. The absolute best example of this is the reason that no human has seen a puppeteer for centuries at the start of the story. We need to evacuate this entire section of the galaxy! The galactic core has ex Exploded! What? When? 10,000 years ago! Um. Okay, and when is the blast wave going to reach us? 20,000 years! We're wasting time talking! Run! Yeah, they evacuated their entire species and started a mass exodus out of the galaxy. 20,000 years in advance, just to be safe. This conveniently leads up to the setup for the plot of this book. The puppeteers are afraid to travel faster than light, so they've been making their way relatively slowly outwards for a few centuries, and they've come across something really, really weird along the way a ring world. As the name implies, a ring world is a ring so massive it loops around a star at a reasonable distance. Okay, sorry if you've already heard this, I just really like talking about it. In his 1937 novel Star Maker, British author Olaf Stapledon made a reference to the idea of surrounding a star with energy collectors to stop letting the colossal amount of energy they give off from going to waste as it bleeds off into space. Some years later, physicist and mathematician Freeman Dyson came up with a thought experiment that concluded that some sort of superstructure around a star with millions of times more living space than your average planet on the inner surface would almost certainly be the inevitable path a sufficiently advanced civilization would take as their power and space requirements exponentially increase. Even though he didn't originally come up with it, and despite his best efforts, the concept was named after him and became popular enough in science fiction to feature in shows like Star Trek The Next Generation. Mr. Data, could this be a Dyson Sphere? The object does fit the general parameters of Dyson's theory. 
A ring world is one of the variants of this train of thought, not a complete sphere, but a ring around a star. While this doesn't collect nearly as much energy, it has the advantages of not requiring you to figure out artificial gravity as centrifugal force can suffice, and only requires a ludicrous amount of building material instead of an insane hecking what the bloody hell are you even talking about ludicrous amount. It still provides you with more living space than the mind can easily comprehend. To put it in perspective, if you took a standard flattened map of Earth's available surface, you could fit 40 of them between the edges of any given part of the ring. This is the width, not the breadth. That's how big this mother lover is. Just the walls rising up from the inner side to hold the atmosphere in are thousands of miles high. So yeah, if you thought that you had a good idea of what to expect because you played Halo, those rings are the equivalent of a wedding band compared to the rings of Saturn when it comes to scale. Obviously the main structure is is made out of a crazy strong fictional metal, then there's about 40 feet of whatever terrain you want to sculpt your world with, making up the livable surface. There's an inner circle of panels in the solar system that serve the dual purpose of casting shadows to simulate a night and day cycle, and collecting the sun's energy to be transferred to the ring. The visual effect of living on this ring sounds really interesting, because it's so massive the reverse horizon is further away than the human eye can see, so the land appears to be extending infinitely in all directions, and what appears to be a mind-bogglingly huge arch crosses over the sky behind the sun, giving the impression that the star is the universe's biggest Christmas decoration dangling from it. Said sun never moves from what to us would appear to be the high noon position. Instead of setting, it appears to be quickly eclipsed every night by the faster orbiting panels. The puppeteers had never come across anything like this before, and were of course too frightened to make first contact by themselves, so they sent one of their insane agents, a puppeteer called Nessus, who, by human standards, is still a steaming pile of wuss, but is by far the bravest of their race, to fly at light speed back to known space and pick up a crew of braver aliens to help him go and inspect it. His selection was Louis Wu, a space adventurer who, through advancements to life extension, had just celebrated his 200th birthday, picked for obvious reasons, speaker to animals, chosen for his military training and physical capabilities, and a 20-year-old woman named Teela Brown with absolutely zero useful skills. To explain Teela, I I have to explain one of Niven's other favourite science fiction concepts, luck as a genetic trait. Yeah, I didn't super dig the science behind this one, but to be fair, neither do the characters in the book until they're given indisputable proof of it, so at least Larry knew that he was pushing it out there pretty far. The theory, in its simplest form, is as follows. If luck, like time, was something tangible and different people had different amounts of it, you could potentially maximise it using eugenics like any other feature. As part of their effort to control their overpopulation issue, Earth started severely restricting how many children people could have. However, once a Year, the right to an extra child would be given to just a few couples. This was chosen by Worldwide Lottery, making your chances of winning one in billions. So, you'd have to be pretty lucky, therefore your child might inherit your genetic luck. Then, what if, by staggering good luck, two children born of this lottery got together, and then they themselves won the lottery and had a child, and then that child married another second generation luck baby as well, and holy heck, then they won the lottery, and so forth and so forth. Teela is the sixth generation born of lottery winners, so her luck is so strong it can almost dictate things on a galactic scale, making Nessus's belief in her value as a team member a lot more understandable. From here on, we approach spoiler territory. It's not a blow by blow of the entire plot, Plot, but if you've not read this book and I have piqued your interest, this would be the time to pause this video and seek it out. Okay, so what Nessus fails to consider is luck for Teela Brown isn't necessarily luck for everyone around her. Yes, the spaceship she's on is probably safe from being completely destroyed, but if it happens to be flying by a place that would be very beneficial for her to visit, because say, her future husband lived there, or there was some much needed personal growth to be found for her there, a catastrophic accident that forces it to crash land would be very lucky for her in the long run. While stranded on the ring world, the team discovers it's populated by humans. If this were a TV show, I'd accuse them of being lazy or trying to keep the budget down, but there is a reasonable explanation for it in this book. The explanation for the ring world's existence in the first place is another result of Niven flexing his deductive world building on us. The line of thought goes, what if there wasn't a universal baseline level of technology that different species would advance to? For example, 
What if inventing a way to travel faster than light wasn't guaranteed because it requires such an obscure discovery about the laws of physics, it might not ever occur to a race no matter how long this civilization lasts for? If a large group of civilizations are close enough to each other that they can make contact, then only one of them has to discover it and be willing to trade it for them all to eventually have it, making colonization of other solar systems the simplest solution to overpopulation. But if a species is completely isolated and never figure out this tech, then interstellar travel is possible but impractical, as a round trip to even the nearest star would take decades at the very least. The race known as the Ringworld Engineers never discover FTL, but they did invent transmutation. They could use science to change any element into another. So what do you do if you want to keep expanding but you can't keep moving outwards? Well you use your ability to effortlessly build to perfect the solar system you're already living in and maximize living space. They consumed every planet, moon, and asteroid in the vicinity and created the ring world. Alas, it proved not to be a foolproof plan as by the time it's discovered by the puppeteers, the ring world civilization had collapsed due to a mismanaged disaster that resulted in the ring losing its connection to its power supply many centuries before. It turns out, if you get knocked back a few millennia in technology on an artificially created world, it's impossible to rebuild from scratch because there's no mineral deposits for the population to tap into. You can't get to the Iron Age without iron ore to dig up, so all you have is a ton of decaying cities and powerless computers and machinery made of a metal that's too durable for you to reforge and repurpose without advanced technology. Now, you may have noticed that even though I'm in spoiler territory, I'm still mostly describing the world building that's revealed in later parts of the book and not dipping into the actual plot all that much. Well, that's because while the world building in Ringworld is second to none, the actual story is only okay. The first problem is every single character is very fascinating, but also a complete and utter wanker. Nessus's cowardice loses its charm real quick, and he is unbelievably manipulative, and Louis... <sighs> Don't even get me started on that condescending, rampant misogynist. Teela was intentionally written to be really annoying because her unfailing lifelong luck has kept her from any kind of pain or hardship, so she has no baseline personal experience that would allow her to feel empathy for anyone else's, and she keeps on doing incredibly stupid things because she just doesn't understand the concept of consequences. The only character I didn't completely hate was Speaker to Animals, because while he was a short-tempered, violent opportunist, he was at least self-aware of it. On top of that, I personally felt that too much of the plot is centered around the exploration of Teela's luck. I mean, sure, it's an interesting idea, but God's damn, I didn't expect something as fascinating as the ring world to become such a minor backdrop to another concept. I will say the final twist of the book, the way they get off the ring world is pretty good, so I'm not going to reveal exactly what it is because I know a lot of people ignore the spoiler warning even though they intend to read the book. The fact that known space became a shared universe seems to suggest to me that a lot of people agree with my assessment that Niven is a better world builder than he is a storyteller. His concepts provide an excellent setting for books written by other authors. One of my personal favorites is Destiny's Forge by Paul Schaaf, some of the plot of which is suspiciously similar to the plot of Dune if all of the characters involved were huge tiger people, but there are more original plots running simultaneously, and I think it provides a lot of really fun insights into Kasinti culture, so that's another option if you find yourself digging the setup, but not the plot of Wingworld. The final comment I'll leave you with is this. At one point in the book, Louis states that he's uncomfortable that both Nessus and his breeding partner go by male pronouns because that doesn't make any sense to him, and the puppeteer's response is to tell him to mind his own business. I don't think that Niven was trying to make any statement beyond puppeteer reproduction is complicated, but I did appreciate that he didn't feel that anyone should have their use of pronouns policed by some arsehole who doesn't understand the situation. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. I appreciate you sticking around to hear me gush about a book I think is flawed, but still pretty amazing and a big part of my introduction to my 
favourite genre of fiction. There is so much more stuff to this universe of Larry Nivens that I didn't get a chance to mention here, so I really do recommend it if you have even the slightest interest in science fiction or good world building. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to help power my channel's shields against the ravages of the YouTube algorithm by leaving all those sexy likes, comments and shares. If you're new here and think you might want to see more, don't forget to subscribe so you can find your way back. If you'd like to support the channel and gain access to extra content, be sure to check out my Patreon page. Please take care of yourselves out there and I hope to see you soon. Say bye, Sateri. There's a ring wild way out in the stars. You'd probably like to go there, but it's really friggin' far. There's a ring wild orbiting a sun, and everybody on it is a prehistoric. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Hope, Zatel Spurdloff, and Kat Harker. Shout out to Il Nej for writing and performing this song, and special thanks to Kaluna of Kaluna Reviews for lending her art talent to this video. If you'd like to see more stuff like this, you should definitely check out her channel. I get to monetize your cuteness in the bloopers now. What are you looking at? The ghosts? Wait. Ow! Punch the table again. Almost wasting Twillions. Twillions! Twillion! Zaphod's stuck in the bathroom again. Doesn't matter if you get my shirt all covered in white hair now because I finished the video, so there. Yeah.